Coming up on Digital Music Trends 208 on the 12th of November 2014, YouTube works things out with Merlin, the Taylor Swift story snowballs and Spotify reacts, MTV and the Music Cubat launch the MTV Tracks app, Cobalt's CEO on transparency, SoundCloud's deal with Warner, BMI reassures Pandora and much more. Hello everyone and welcome to Digital Music Trends, I'm Andrea Leonelli and this is the weekly show where we talk about and try to make sense of the latest news in the digital music industry and uh, Digital Music Trends is available on a wide range of streaming services. If you are on iOS 8 for example, you may have noticed that the podcast app is back, it's uh, built in once again so there has never been an easier way to access uh, uh, or subscribe to the show but if you're on Android, fear not, you can also uh, down- go and download Dog Catcher and that will cater to all your podcasting needs. And the show comes out pretty much every week uh, towards the end of the week but if you'd like to know exactly when it's out because I'm not exactly uh, as precise as clockwork uh, you should subscribe to the newsletter which is on bit.ly slash dmt list and you'll get an email uh, right in your inbox uh, when the show is out and uh, this week it's a real pleasure to welcome uh, Jesse Scholar uh, director at Wixted Works and a specialist uh, which is a a specialist direct to fan agency so hi Jesse and thanks for joining me how's it going? It's going well, thank you, Andrea. Thank you for having me. It's a uh, great to have you, and uh, uh, it's uh, also a real pleasure. I'm thrilled to welcome back uh, Matthew Hahn, who specializes in product leadership and audience development for media companies, and has worked uh, as VP of Digital Distribution at Sony Music, as VP of Product at Last FM, and also a side of strategy and planning uh, at Samsung. So, hi, Matthew, and thanks for joining me. Hi, Andrea. Hi, nice to be here. Thanks. It's great to have you, and uh, uh, yeah, it's, it's an exciting show today. There's a lot going on, and hopefully we're going to be able to cover it uh, in some detail. Uh, but uh, uh, actually, we're going to start with the breaking news. I want to sort of uh, leave the Taylor Swift news as the second one, but the first news that actually broke last night uh, is that YouTube has finally reached a deal with uh, uh, Merlin, apparently. That's reported by the Financial Times, who seems to be getting all the scoops actually recently. I don't know what they're, what they're doing, but uh, the Robert Cookson is doing a great job out there. And uh, uh, the company agreed uh, uh, to terms apparently for uh, the, st- uh, the YouTube streaming service uh, uh, although neither of them has officially acknowledged the deal yet. Uh, it's important to note that uh, Merlin's members uh, d- you know, d- are not opted in automatically into these deals. Uh, Merlin makes a sort of a framework deal and then uh, the members have the opportunity to decide whether they want to opt in or not. Um, Obviously, uh, long-time listeners of the show will know that back in June there was a, a, a massive controversy that broke and, and we covered it for about four or five weeks uh, around uh, uh, YouTube's uh, attitude towards independent labels. Uh, it was said that YouTube had inked a deal with the major labels uh, for the service, but uh, obviously they had a big gap uh, uh, um, when it came to independence and, uh, uh, for example, Impala went as far as filing an official antitrust complaint with the European Commission uh, uh, against the video streaming service. So, you know, uh, quite serious allegations there and uh, you know now it seems like the service could launch in a matter of weeks uh, although you know as I said uh, those deals still have to be opted in by the individual labels that are part of uh, uh, Merlin and uh, uh, it's gonna be interesting to see how how uh, some of the players that are criticizing Spotify uh, react uh, and we're gonna talk about that a little bit later on. Uh, Amanda what what, are, what is your take on uh, YouTube uh, uh, finally getting Merlin on, Merlin on board? That's a big step towards launching the service. Do, do you think that uh, this is gonna come out towards, uh, by the end of the year? Uh, we hope so. I mean I think it's been rumored for so long that this service has been sitting there. There were some changes. Their head of product left yeah. Um, just before the launch of that, he's he's gone to do something new. So that you know, it's it's always interesting to see who the leadership is at YouTube because it's such an amorphous blob. Yeah. Um, you never know who's actually running something at YouTube at uh, at Google and YouTube. But hopefully, this will clear the path. Um, when I sat across the table from YouTube and and the and the and the labels when I was at Last FM, you know, we had all kinds of conversations with them about <clears throat> about the labels in particular, about and the indies in particular, about how what it was going to take to get them to be part of our services. Same thing with when I was at Samsung. Right. Um, and it's, so it's a big step to get Merlin. Um, everybody knows if you get Merlin, usually that means beggars and Merlin are usually aligned, and that's the one that everyone's really trying to, to get together. So I'm glad to see them finally come to the table. Um, I hope that Google and YouTube step up their relationship with the Indies. They're super important these days. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Jesse, for, from your perspective, uh, how, how do you feel, you know, you work with independent artists for the most part. Do you think that this deal might spur more independence to feel more comfortable with the whole thing, uh, you know, when they've been pretty suspicious up to now? 
Yeah, I think it's a it's a good step forward. Um, you know, that kind of opens the gates, as it were. As you say, they still have to opt in on an individual basis, or they have their opportunity, um, which is great. It just it, it seems like a good way to move forward. Yeah. And I mean, you know, more streaming services. Uh, it's going to be a good thing. Yeah, exactly. And I mean, you know, there's a lot of opportunity there. You know, we, uh, I guess, uh, uh, you worked a lot with Topspin, and, and they were one of the first companies to do a deal with YouTube to integrate uh, uh, merchandise sales, for example, into, into mm -hmm. the channel. Do you think that there's more opportunity there uh, to uh, upsell uh, people that are fans of, of certain artists on, on YouTube channels into buying more products? Yeah, I think that's a really good point that you make. Um, the the list of approved retailers on YouTube is just growing and growing. This you know it's it's really quite extensive now. There are many 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 retailers are approved to a feature in the merch annotations, and um, that's got to be a good thing for for commerce for yeah. artists commerce. Absolutely, and I mean. You know, obviously, we can't discount uh, Google as the sort of com commerce powerhouse that it is. Uh, mm. Spotify is doing really great work. Uh, along those lines with the, uh, the uh, band page deal, for example, but they don't have the same leverage when it comes to search, for example, to offer some sort of integration between, you know, videos and, and shopping results and everything else. So yeah. maybe they have a leg up there when it comes to uh, upselling to uh, D2, D2F or D2C type uh, offerings from, from bands. Spotify has something like 40 million users paying or otherwise but when it comes right. down to it YouTube is, is the biggest streaming service in the world so an advantage in, in commerce on YouTube and, and a, a wider uh, playing field wider playing field that, that's got to be a good thing yeah exactly Matt uh, sorry you were, you were saying something and then we got interrupted yeah I, I, you know in this in this era we get value from all these services one of three ways right it, audience size as Jesse was talking about just the scope um, the other thing we get value on is just the data which I think has been largely lacking from most services it's one of my biggest complaints about Apple uh, and likewise about people like Amazon who are major players in this but just don't share their data with you yeah um, both Spotify and uh, and Google are generally pretty good about that the question is going to be will they also share the 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 relationship with a customer, and this is where people like Jesse and her and her consultations really come into play. Here, you want to optimize your relationships with your customers, yeah, um, and with your fans, right? And if you can't do that, if you don't own those relationships, and if you can't make those connections, that you know you're not. And you're, we certainly know the services aren't paying as much as we'd all like them to be paying for this. Right. That, that revenues need to be come from multiple sources. So you got to get paid one of those three ways: attention, data, or actual cash, right? And Optimizing the mix of those three is what every artist manager is supposed to be doing. Yeah, and and we'll see if this service launches. Uh, I mean, we've been talking about it for two years now. So, yeah. uh, and I mean, the, the other thing that was interesting to longer you, than that actually. And they've been, you know, YouTube, <laughs> Google's been negotiating with every one of the labels for forever, right? So, yeah, exactly. I mean, one of the things that actually happened in July was that the product manager in charge of music, Chris La Rosa, left the company. So, I wonder whether that had anything to do with a change in tactics and the way they were negotiating the deals or anything like that, or whether it's completely unrelated. But they've had a couple of people sort of come and go uh, as this crisis unfolded so um it's you know it's it's the collision between um play and youtube that we're talking about right i mean there's just yeah. the politics there are massive um and as you as as google has shifted the android team and the play team around they've moved those guys around that meant you had enormous politics at play and you know i'd hard to know what chris why chris left he left for a non-music opportunity um you know so it's hard to know why he left and what reasons are but sure. certainly the shifting sands at google um weren't helpful yeah and i'm reading how google works now and that uh, they talk so much about the don't be evil uh sort of part of their culture and some of the stuff that they did that it looked like they did uh, at least uh, with youtube uh, earlier in the year didn't look particularly uh, nice at least when it come, came to the yeah. independent sector so and uh, maybe they have had a change of heart uh, to do with the company's core uh, culture and policy and uh, uh you know let's let's talk about uh, taylor swift obviously it's a uh, the story that we have to address uh, this week uh, it's kind of a snowballed since uh, you know I, I i asked a few people at the web summit last week to comment on what they thought about it uh, it had just broken really uh, it was uh, only a day 24 hours to 36 hours in when i spoke to uh, various companies about it um it kind of it kind of snowballed since then uh, after the fact uh, last week uh, as I, I i talked about on the show many pointed at uh, scott burketta uh, the owner of uh, her label big machine as the principal reason for the takedowns 
stating that he was trying to increase the value of the label prior to a sale. Uh, so that could have been a contributing factor, but the story kind of lost credibility as a, as a principal justification as Taylor Swift uh, spoke directly about uh, Spotify during an interview with Yahoo Music uh, towards the end of last week, uh, uh, where he, she stated, uh, but all I can say is that music is changing so quickly and the landscape of the music industry itself is changing so quickly that everything new like Spotify all feels to me like a bit of a grand, uh, like a bit like a grand experiment. And I'm not willing to contribute my life's work to an experiment that I don't feel fairly compensates the writers, producers, artists and creators of this music. And I just don't agree with perpetuating the perception that music has no value and should be free. And uh, Taylor's move already is making waves uh, uh, th throughout the states. You know, country star Jason Aldean uh, followed her lead uh, um, yes, just yesterday by removing his latest album uh, from Spotify. It looks like uh, at least I had a look around yesterday and it looked like uh, six out of the top 10 albums in the Billboard 200 are currently not available on the service. Uh, they include uh, releases by Taylor Swift, Sam Hunt, Barry Manilow, Jason Aldean, uh, Chris Tomlin and Slipknot. Uh, and at the same time, we've seen uh, the CEO of Ardio, for example, uh, gloat and stress the fact that uh, they still have uh, uh, Taylor Swift's uh, back catalog uh, because they do not offer a free ad supported and unlimited uh, service uh, that is essentially offering uh, unlimited free music to consumers so that is what Swift and her label are against. Uh, um, all this prompted Spotify CEO to publish an unusually personal post uh, on the company's blog where he states uh, that the talk swirling around lately uh, about how Spotify is making money on the back of artists upsets me big time. So uh, finally sort of a direct statement around this uh, Eck then goes on to state uh, why uh, some of the rumors um, or some of the arguments uh, uh, against Spotify don't make sense and he also revealed that the company now has uh, 12.5 million premium subscribers and that they have paid over two billion dollars uh, to, to the music industry over uh, since 2008 uh, essentially so it's uh, big numbers there. Uh, Jesse from your part you know how do you s this is a big story there's a lot to talk about but you know from your perspective how do you see this affect the way uh, uh, people perceive Spotify and do you think this may uh, lead some more artists into choosing not to publish the music there? Yeah, as you say, this is this is a big issue and th there's lots of really interesting arguments to it. Um, I think it's definitely problematic for Spotify um, and I can completely empathise, I suppose, um, or at least sympathise with uh, Daniel Ek's frustration as expressed in his blog post last night. Um, you know, I think it's clear that Spotify and the streaming services, as they currently stand, are not necessarily the last word. Um, if moves like this are taken up on a wide scale by major artists, then it's going to really undermine their value proposition. And that's a real shame, I think. Um, but at the same time, this isn't the first time at all by a long stretch in, in this music industry of ours that, um, you know, certain artists have pulled their rights or, or pulled their content from a particular platform or a particular license um, structure. And with a, you know, in a bid to get a better deal for themselves. Um, so, you know, it kind of just comes around again and it's, yeah. it's really interesting <laughs> to, to witness. I think it's just, it's, it's very, to call it a grand experiment is, you know, that's a valid statement. But the fact is that the genie is out of the bottle. Um, I don't think that there's, we know we're not going back to the traditional industry, the 80s yeah. and the 90s, you know, it's it's sad in some ways, but it, we're moving on. Uh, shall we go back to not having color television or cars, you know, just to, to be a little extreme with that argument? And, you know, just to continue, I do agree with her. Artists have a right to be paid, yeah. um, to have their work valued, and she clearly can do what she wants with, with her exactly. content. Um, when it comes down to it, I think it's it's just it's another kind of outbreak in the argument, the ongoing argument between creators and, and rights holders yeah. um, and, and the, the middle services like Spotify to work out what's a fair payment and how to split that out. Yeah, and Matt, uh, I guess like as Jassi said, this is just a, a, a recurring argument, but because of the scale of the service, uh, also the scale of the argument and the, the kind of people involved is, is uh, uh, rising all the time. So last year we had Tom York, sort of like a big artist, but not yeah. a Taylor Swift in terms of impact. You know, I think this is the this is an area that, that the artist managers need to jump into and talk about. And you're seeing some of them do that, right? Um, I'm great. It's great to hear the artists talk about it, but it's also good to hear the management talk about it, right? Because an artist management's job is to optimize their artists' 
value in the in, in these ecosystems. And and we certainly have seen the big technology companies. I've worked for a couple of them. You know, Samsung is using music to increase loyalty to their services. How do you value that? Yeah. Um, you know, so with with a pure player like Spotify, who is purely in the business of selling you a subscription, they're doing a fantastic job. Their their revenues in the UK, Spotify announced their results are what up almost fifty percent. And subscription revenue. That's good news for everybody, right? Yeah. Subscription services are about being paid. And I think Daniel's made some really good points. But it's not the only place we make money in the industry, right? I mean, Jesse will tell you that, that, that any artist out here has to be making their money from a number of services. Um, you know, I've been doing this for 15 years now in digital music. And every year when I was on the label side or when I was on the, the, the services side, every year we said, oh, this is the year of consolidation, right? We're right. going to see fewer services. And it's just not been true, right? Every year it's gotten bigger, more complicated, more choices for fans. Um, as an industry, we need to move people towards value for music. People understanding that music is being used, it has value to people. And, and it's all important to do that for the younger audience, right? Yeah. And you can see this, we can talk about um, MTV's new Tracks service, which is a free to listen service that's going to be cached music, which is super important for that audience. But we're also not looking at the whole pl the whole spectrum of things, right? Yeah. Spotify is one type of audience, um, Tracks will be somebody else, BBC is one type of audience. There's all kinds of audiences for music, and an artist has a right to decide where they, where the, what mix they want, yeah. you know, and management needs to, to speak up about that. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it all comes down also, it, it brings in the argument around transparency, which is something that yeah. Mac touches upon in the post where he states that yeah. there's a lot of confusion around how the, the revenue flow goes back to artists. There's delays in uh, artists seeing the money that comes from streaming services, which leads them to believe that there isn't any money. Uh, uh, also, uh, Cobalt CEO uh, uh, Willard Ardritz uh, spoke at the Web Summit in Dublin uh, last week, and I, I wrote, a, I, I was there, I wrote a piece around the fact that, you know, he says that, uh, you know, Cobalt was built as a technology company with a strong music DNA and their number one priority is transparency uh, for artists, they service the artists and, and the publisher that they work for. And so for them, the number one priority is to create a, a flow of uh, revenues that uh, uh, you know comes in, ti in a timely manner, you know, is distributed in a timely fashion, and also uh, is transparent, and so people know what they are earning from what service. And so uh, that's the kind of thing that a lot of uh, music companies, both on the master and the publishing side, haven't invested a huge amount of money in it yet. Uh, you know, Cobalt states that they've, uh, they've invested $50 million in developing the system that's, uh, that's uh, sort of uh, taking care of all of this. And that's definitely, from my experiences, at least uh, back at Universal Music Publishing, when I, when I was talking with them uh, and doing some de uh, licensing deals uh, um, from, a, from a music startup standpoint, it didn't look like they had the infrastructure uh, that is required to uh, do this kind of uh, reporting uh, as Cobalt is doing. So, uh, yeah, I mean, transparency, big issue. Uh, Jesse, do you think that uh, we're going to see more investment from the industry on this front, or are they going to keep shifting the blame on digital services for not paying enough money? Well, <laughs> that's an interesting way of putting the question. Yeah, yeah, I mean, here's hoping we move towards more transparency. I think, I think that would be an ideal outcome, um, but I, I don't no, I think that might be a little optimistic to think that's going to be happening anytime soon. Yeah, exactly. To be honest, I think that when it comes to the majors, uh, they're so bogged down in, in archaic systems that it's actually really quite a problematic uh, way. It, it's just, they don't know how to do it. You know, it's like this is this is this is tough. Yeah, it's not it's not an easy road to take. Uh, 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 Matthew, for, for you, you know, we've seen the breakdown, for example, of the GRD. Uh, that could have brought a, a little bit more clarity around licensing. Uh, you know, is, is the industry yeah. hell bent on uh, maintaining some of these old structures, or are they trying to change things around? I think we need to be careful to look at the whole value from yeah. these from these deals too. I mean, you know, when when Spot when when uh, Beats was sold to Apple, there was a huge windfall for Universal Music. Yeah. You know, a large amount of money that they received. How much of that was paid out to artists? Zero, right? Yeah. That's not. That's not. That's a. You know, they all have equity positions in these services. Um, the amount of money that's been invested in Spotify is at several hundred million from various sources, and those investors are going to want to get paid out. Um, and they're looking to opt. To, they're, they're, these are businesses we're talking about. So yeah. you know, the artists do get squeezed in the middle of these, um, and the only way for them not to be squeezed. And I, I keep coming back to this. I, you know, I ran 
direct to fan services, even inside the record labels, our goal was to try to make sure that there was a that we reduced the number of middlemen, yeah. even even in that case. And obviously, you're trying to optimize to be one of those good middlemen, and that's what Cobalt's doing. Cobalt's basically saying to people, "We'll be a great service. We'll add value to you, and we'll make it really clear the value we're adding." Yeah. That's a positive thing, and it's something that is just sorely lacking from the major labels. Um, I think the, even the indies have a challenge with this. They don't have the money to invest in those systems to make it more transparent. But uh, you know, I, I think that it's the faster we get to clear clarity. I think I like the quote from the Cobalt CEO. He said, "You know, transparency creates liquidity, and liquidity creates growth." And I think that's right. You know, that the the more transparent we'll be, the faster we'll see the industry grow to to, be, to better numbers. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And, you know, one, I would love to be a fly on the wall and sort of know exactly what kind of figures uh, Taylor Swift had in front of her when she did, she made that decision. Because, yeah. uh, you know, that, that's that's a key factor. And who gave her the figures and what kind of figures did they, did they give her? What kind of projections uh, uh, she had in, in, in her hand when, when the decision was made? Because obviously, I, I guess, you know, for, for an artist that is concerned about the future, long term uh, future of the industry, getting $10 from a user today is better than getting perhaps more in streams over the long term uh, over 10 20 years uh, but uh, i wonder how that's going to evolve over, over the next couple of years and uh, the interesting thing is that also soundcloud was uh, uh, called in uh, by um, uh, daniel x post uh, he mentions the service i think two or three times uh, as yeah. a service that doesn't yet pay any money uh, towards the music industry uh, and so that's kind of a bit of a stab at the service i guess uh, you know, one of the stories that uh, came out last week was a SoundCloud announced uh, uh, reaching a deal with Warner Music, and the Warner Music uh, is uh, supposedly taking some uh, equity stake in the company, which is anywhere between three and five percent, uh, according to the Wall Street Journal. Um, um, the company has also uh, done a deal with Warner Chapel. Warner of, often bundles uh, the two uh, sort of entities together when, when making deals with the uh, digital services, so that uh, uh, seems to make sense uh, according to their usual business practices. Uh, and uh, uh, you know, one wonders uh, how uh, long it's going to take for SoundCloud to actually get uh, the likes of Universal Music and Sony Music on board to um, uh, to get to a wider deal and actually roll out a service uh, uh, you know Matt, uh, Matthew, in, in your view what what how do you see SoundCloud positioning itself uh, in this uh, ecosystem that is becoming quite messy and uh, uh, a little bit uh, confusing I guess for users because we're going to be bombarded with new services if uh, YouTube comes out with their own and SoundCloud come out with their own sometime next year yeah, I, th I think we need to determine what kind of services each of these guys are. You can see them all starting to position themselves a little yeah. bit. I, I think I saw um, someone posted this on Twitter that they, you can see RDO aligning behind terrestrial radio with their deal with Cumulus. You can see um, Deezer trying to hook up with podcasts. You know, and where SoundCloud has always had its strong seat is, has been in that promotional channel, right? New and independent artists who want to place a simple way to make sure they reach the most fans. Yeah. Um, as they attempt to monetize, uh, it's not surprising they pulled in Stephen Bryant, who was a longtime Warner exec, 17 years at Warner. It's not surprising to see them do their first deal with Warner since he knew the players there. Um, so, you know, they, they've got to figure out how they're going to turn more value out. They seem to be coming along the same lines as YouTube's original plan, yeah. which was to say, we're going to be the YouTube of audio. We want to be the promotional channel. And that isn't going to sit well with labels because they're like, look, I don't, we don't get paid enough from YouTube, right? <laughs> YouTube has been a promotional channel for us. So they're in a tough place to, to make that work. Because um, the, the YouTube of audio is, is kind of becoming YouTube if they get this. Well, and their numbers are good, right? <laughs> 350 million um, is the numbers for SoundCloud. Oh, I mean, SoundCloud yeah. 350 million streams per month, and that's coming through great tools. It's, it is a great platform if you want your music to be heard, right? Fantastic for that way. You could choose where you put it. The question is, how do you turn that into revenue or value? Even if you can't get revenue directly from that or lower revenue, how do you get the value that you want from that? And, um, and to me, that's where they seem to be positioning themselves. YouTube's in a weird place because they're trying to have it both ways. They're trying to claim a promotional channel. They're also trying to claim that they're a, a service channel, a subscription yeah. channel. That's a tough place too, right? I mean, they just they have the scale to do that, but I think it's going to be a tough challenge. But if you if you were to advise somebody, you know, what what, what is your take uh, personally as far as okay. you know whether I, I know that people have different feelings as to whether uh, SoundCloud delivers value or not uh, to their label or to their to their artists. Uh, some people say that it's fantastic. Some people say that they would rather have them materially on YouTube and actually make uh, that little amount of money that YouTube affords you to make uh, uh, through mm. advertising. What's your take on that? Yeah, well, I think 
in terms of community building and fan engagement, the SoundCloud is a great tool for that. Yeah. Um, you know, you can do a lot with it as well in terms of building on top of it and, and creating content to, to stream out via the API to, to your own website. Um, yeah, I think that, you know, used in tandem with other fan building tools um, so that you're not giving away content necessarily for free without an email address, that kind of thing. Yeah. It's definitely, definitely got value and it's clearly a, a large community, which is great. Yeah, absolutely. And now we're going to continue watching the story around uh, sort of what's going on with SoundCloud and uh, uh, whether, you know, the, the, the key question mark for them is universal because uh, it didn't look like Lucian Grange in the latest interview that he gave uh, was convinced by the business plan yet. And so one wonders how and whether they're going to be able to change it, given that they have already signed a deal with Warner to ma make sure that uh, Universal is on board. So yeah, yeah. I, I heard some folks say that the meetings with um, sound with us between SoundCloud and Universal were pretty bad. Yeah, um, the rumors were very strong that the presentation they were seeing was about an investment presentation, not a plan for how they make it into a service. And I think that's got a shift, right? That's the shift that you see. I, I'm pleased to see Steven come over and join SoundCloud. Um, and it's something that was lacking in Google's conversations. They were they were coming as a technology company, not as an artist partnership platform. You know. One of the things that I see again and again from our, and this is true of the labels, right? It's true of the indies and it's true of the majors. Yeah. They rarely come with a plan, a go to market plan with their artists. What they really have always done is they, they were still aimed at this point in which the people who do the deals with the music services are business development guys and they're trying to optimize something potentially. And then you've got the marketing people way over here and they're not, they're not talking to each other, right? In one case, the marketing department goes straight to YouTube and says, we're trying to get numbers. I, my, all my metrics are about how many YouTube views I get. And over here, you have the business development guys who are saying, all my metrics are how much revenue I bring in. And they're not, that's not a holistic approach to this. And, yeah. and that's also been true of the, uh, of the services. The services don't go to the labels or the other uh, artist managers and say, how do we make these things work together? How do we combine these two approaches, right? How do we have a holistic view that gets the best value for artists and the best value for your services? We're just not doing that yet. Yeah. Um, and until the labels combine those people and as they get smaller and smaller, there won't be enough people left to not combine it. Yeah. <laughs> And uh, Jesse, I wanted to uh, jump on and uh, ask you a little bit about uh, the which platform uh, report that you released. Uh, uh, you mentioned uh, uh, something around that uh, back when you were uh, on the show a few months ago. But since then, the report has actually come out. So uh, tell me a little bit about how uh, the research shaped up uh, for you in, in that uh, uh, domain and uh, what the report, uh, report is and how people can get hold of it. Okay, Let, yeah, I will do Three that. Three questions um, all rolling <laughs> on. <laughs> the, the whole thing. You have the floor. Okay. I have the floor. Okay, so basically what, what happened was um, I was in a client meeting uh, late last year and uh, we were discussing uh, an artist schedule of um, upcoming releases. Um, one of the managers turned to me in, in this meeting and, and said, Jesse, direct to fan, which is the best platform. And in a, in a moment of, of um, blankness, I realized I didn't actually know the answer to that question, um, which, you know, as a direct fan practitioner poses a, a little bit of a challenge, but also quite a big opportunity. So um, in, the, in the following months, I spent a lot of time um, researching and, and really surveying the market, doing comprehensive analysis of 10 of the leading services that are available here in the UK. Um, with the goal of really setting out for artists and managers and labels who want to make the best use of direct fan as a channel, really setting out for them what it is exactly that each of these services is offering and setting it out in an easy to follow way so that you're not having to make the decision based on poor information or just kind of hearing of a service or being sold a service but not really knowing exactly what's involved and what it does. Yeah. So we've got 10 services included in this first edition. Um, do you want me to rattle through those names? Uh, sure, of course. Okay. So we've got Bandcamp, Crowd Surge, Music Glue, Pledge Music, uh, Relentless Generator, Sandbag, Stage Block, Sunshine HQ, TM Stores, and Topspin. Nice. And basically what we do is we identify a set of more than 40 criteria with which we measure each of those services and set them all out um, essentially on a, on a big kind of a, a grid yeah. um, and then go into a, a lot more detail exactly about how each of those points is handled. That's oh, fantastic. and yeah. it's available from our website. So you can get Great. a free sample um, by going to wixdeedworks.com slash which platform. Go to the website, grab a free sample, um, get a feel for what's included, what's involved, um, send through any questions, whatever you like, and, and 
come back and buy it. Awesome, it's, it's fantastic. And, you know, it, it, there's a bunch of different services as well on the site, uh, which include, you know, the report plus uh, uh, some some consultancy help as well uh, for those that need a little bit of direction. Uh, I don't know that there's a lot of uh, uh, label services companies and agencies that listen to the show as well, so I'm sure that's going to be of interest to them uh, too. And uh, thanks so much for that. Again, it's wixedworks.com. And uh, Matt, Matthew mentioned the uh, um, O2, sorry, the Music Cube bad uh, uh, story, and so essentially what happened is the Music Cube. Bad, uh, which is a company behind the O2 tracks service that uh, uh, it's done pretty well in the UK you know that they showed that there is an alternative uh, a market for streaming service uh, for a streaming service that is a, a lower price point and appeals to a different type of audience than perhaps Spotify does and they've launched a partnership with MTV in the UK so Music Cube Ad of, of course a uh, sort of a third party that sits at the back and can provide a white label service uh, almost uh, to, to uh, any company really and uh, what they've done is uh, uh, releasing a MTV tracks a mobile app available for iOS as an Android, uh, which uh, uh, celebrates the 20th anniversary of the MTV Europe Music Awards. Uh, and so uh, the app is free to access for three months. Uh, so apparently between now and January, I would, I would imagine. Uh, there isn't an, a specific end date on the blog post, but uh, uh, it offers listeners the opportunity to wake up to the hottest uh, songs that are downloaded overnight, free of charge onto their device. So uh, it actually looks really nice. It's, it's a neat app, uh, very easy to navigate. It has got all the latest artists, uh, you know, playlists. It's got Nicki Minaj's greatest uh, songs. It's got the EMA performance playlist. It's got a One Direction playlist with some of the biggest tracks. Uh, a workout time playlist. It's it's a pretty comprehensive app for people that like uh, mainstream pop music. And uh, uh, you know, their aim is to be the only music app you'll ever need. I guess in brackets, if you are a mainstream pop music consumer. Uh, and uh, you know, the question mark, of course, is around monetization. The app is totally free at the moment. Uh, there is no there is no advertising on it. Uh, it's a three-month experiment. I would guess that MTV is uh, testing the waters and then might launch a paid service if the app does really well, unless this is purely just a branding exercise and the plan to shut it down after the three months. Uh, I don't know. Uh, uh, Matt, Matthew, do you think that this would make sense uh, at all? Uh, or would it? I don't know. I think it's I think it's an MTV branding exercise. I right. think it's primarily just to keep, you know, it's, it's, a, it's after an important audience, which is the, you know, 14 to 24-year-olds who don't pay for music. It's very clear that that's who they're after, right? So yeah. it's also important to note that they um, the app works really well on caching, so they are able to cache the stuff because that audience doesn't have mobile plans then, or their, yeah. or their mobile plans are very low on data, and, they, and they're very data conscious. Uh, I'm working with some some really good guys in Ireland uh, who run the Soundwave app, um, right. great music app for uh, for tracking what you listen to and, and sharing that around. And they've done some great research into that audience in particular. That That's that's a big focus for them. Uh, and one of the things they were very clear on is if, if you can't cache the music, and, and they use iTube, which is a big a draw for them. So a legitimate cached service for people who don't pay for music, who want free services, is important but um if i'm an artist I'm, if i'm taylor swift's management i don't want to be on that app that's a good point right because it's you know even though that's the audience they're going to reach how do i get information back i don't think that service has talked about how how what the value they're going to add for artists yeah get the value you're going to get for for mtv that's very clear and i think customers are going to be very happy with that app um it does give them if you're a one direction fan just to be able to play one direction tracks for free great yeah exactly. um, <laughs> but i don't see how it drives people to uh to become you know, uh, an engaged customer with One Direction. Maybe, maybe MTV will come out and explain why. But so far, I see it's good for MTV and good for customers, but not so great for artists. And I guess you know, MTV has to pay. Has to front, if this is just a marketing exercise, they have to front yeah. some pretty hefty fees because Music Cube Ad obviously has deals with all the majors and stuff yeah. for the licensing side of things. So they still have to pay for every yeah. stream that is made on the platform. Uh, Jesse, do you, do you think it makes sense uh, as uh, uh, as Matthew said? Uh, that this would be, uh, uh, you know, just a pr promotional thing for a limited amount, and then get shut down. Or do you think that MTV might have uh, some sort of uh, longer-term plans around it? I think there would have to be some kind of longer-term plan. You know, uh, in terms of converting to paying customers. I don't know. Maybe they want to do some uh, data mining, figure out exactly which playlists are more popular, in order to feed into a, a grander scheme. Yeah. It doesn't really seem to make sense that they would go to the trouble of, of launching something to just shut it down. You know? Yeah, exactly. I think you know would also probably piss users off. Like you know, if if, yeah. you, if you get used to a service for three months and then MTV says, oh, actually, you know, we are sticking by what we said. We're actually going to shut it down. People that actually got used to every morning waking up and expecting some sort of new 
music to be on their device uh, are going to be pretty miffed with MTV. Yeah, so that, would be, yeah. that would be crazy. But they don't actually, they just say that it's free for the first three months, don't they? They don't yeah. actually say that it's only going to be live for three months. Yeah, yeah, it's a good experiment for them. I mean, exactly. but it's a it's a brand thing. I mean, it's making MTV relevant. I mean, they, I imagine the amount of money they'll pay out in streaming costs for this are probably the equivalent of one of their giant MTV television ads, right? So it's probably not an expensive exercise for them. No. Is it a long term strategy for music with them? Maybe if they acquire great customers and they turn all these people into regular viewers and 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 retain and retain their relevance in the industry as a music player, absolutely valuable for them. Yeah, but, it's kind of an experiment, but, right? You know, we're going to throw yeah. a few hundred thousand pounds at this, and then if it sticks, we can launch something off the And if it, if it does turn into an audience, you know, I, I, we, I don't think we've, ex we've, ex we've, uh, we've gone to the full extent we need to in terms of, um, of, of pricing models and understanding the app ec economy, right? I mean, it, I, the numbers from Benedict Evans show just how massively important mobile is. And you know most of the platforms we've seen so far, and, and, and we're at the earliest stages. No one's really nailing the music platforms really well on mobile yet. I mean, we just haven't been there yet. I, the Vivo app is doing okay. Um, you know, Spotify. I'd, I'd love to see the Spotify numbers. You know, their mobile their mobile strategy. They're getting better so, certainly, but I don't think we figured out payment. You know, right. Daniel was very clever in his in his note to talk about the the fact that Spotify's mobile app is not an on demand service. It's a, it, it's you're still using a radio style service. You don't get to choose the tracks, the free version anyway. The paid version obviously gives you whatever you want. But that's what that's where the labels do the line. Yeah. Because mobile is the important part of this. That's where most of their customers are going to reach them now. And most fans are going to come through a mobile device, not through a desktop PC. So mobile is really the most important place to experiment and learn what the right models are. Yeah, and I, I just I just uh, thought I'd bring up on the fly. Uh, I remembered that there were some numbers released when Bloom uh, uh, FM uh, went uh, uh, down uh, last year, uh, well, uh, early this year, essentially. Uh, and... There were some numbers released around the 2013 earnings, and uh, the figure was that they uh, had 205,000 uh, pounds in royalty payments to rights holders in 2013, uh, set against you know uh, revenues of only 42,000 uh, pounds and uh, two and a half million spent on promotion and marketing. So, uh, actually, the, the the royalty side was expensive-ish, but it wasn't that expensive. So, I guess you know if if we're talking about two, three, four hundred thousand pounds that MTV has to front. Uh, to for this initiative plus a little bit of front-end work uh, uh, for for developing the app itself then it does seem like a, a worthwhile experiment to see if it's gonna work and yeah no, I mean, it, we'll see how that pans out and uh, uh, talking about streaming actually uh, back from from the UK to the US uh, a real quick mention of uh, what's going on in the US uh, as far as uh, the whole uh, performing rights uh, uh, um, uh, royalties uh, um, uh, that uh, we've been discussing for the past few months. Uh, uh, it seems like uh, uh, Pandora uh, 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 has been reassured by BMI that uh, the big publishers are not going to pull their catalogs from the uh, uh, collection society just yet. Uh, so this is an interesting news because, uh, uh, as we know, uh, the likes of Sony ATV, uh, it was the most vocal publisher uh, uh, around that with Martin Bandier stating that uh, if uh, uh, the uh, consent decrees uh, weren't changed, uh, then uh, Sony TV would pull out of uh, ASCAP and BMI altogether, which caused a bit of an earthquake in the, in the uh, uh, sort of um, performing rights organizations in the uh, US uh, a few months back. Uh, it seems like this is not going to be the case. I mean, that seemed to be an empty threat in the first place because uh, the cost of actually taking on board what ASCAP and BMI do for a publisher like Sony TV, aside from the digital, digital front, it would have been so high and I don't think there is an infrastructure to actually provide that uh, that can come from a third party yet. So yeah, I mean that, that seemed like an empty threat but it's good to know that uh, BMI and and hopefully also ASCAP will be able to retain uh, the big publishers in the foreseeable future. Uh, and uh, you know, obviously the the, the copyright royalty board is is uh, looking at the rates. Uh, there is a review of the consent decree going on, and we don't know how that's going to pan out. But uh, uh, interesting stuff happening in the states around that. And uh, who knows? We could even see some uh, some performance royalties uh, come from radio in the in the future if uh, they manage to get their uh, heads together around that. Although with the, the recent uh, issues. With Congress and stuff. I, I don't know how much actually is going to get through uh, over the next couple of years. Uh, I, I don't know if either of you has anything to say around this, but it's a fairly technical story. But if you do, just just shout. <laughs> no, it's just it's still a mess. The, the, we, you know, talking about who's not paying people. The U.S. radio guys are 
at this point should be paying for what yeah. they use, right? The you, I used to work for CBS Radio. Um, last FM was owned by CBS Radio, and CBS had excellent local revenues that are not being shared to the extent that they should have been with artists yeah. in the same way they are everywhere in the world. So that's that's clearly an area that they should be working on, and, and I'd, I'd rather them lobby the U.S. radio holders rather than beat up on Spotify, to be honest with you. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And uh, and so uh, moving on from that, uh, we've also seen that uh, uh, there's been a couple of uh, sort of uh, more minor stories that I just want to touch upon. First of all, uh, Amanda Palmer has released her uh, The Art of Asking book, uh, which is interesting, actually, Jesse. I wonder whether it's something that you're uh, looking into because obviously it's got some implication in the D2F or D2C category because she talks about how she talks with, with her fans and how she overcame the fear of asking uh, them for help uh, uh, through her career. Obviously not applicable to all artists, but it could mm. be an interesting read. What, what, what do you make of that? Absolutely. No, I think that's definitely worth a read. I mean, her story in, in terms of tapping into the, the crowdfunding opportunities has really lit the way, I think, for a, for, for the industry, um, just by way of the, the publicity and the massive success that she's seen through it. Yeah. Um, and also, you know, unsurprisingly, the, some of the backlash that she's also had to deal with. Um, no, I think I, I haven't got, I haven't read read the book. Yet. Oh, I just come out, I, so I haven't read it yeah, either. Yeah. No, I'm intending to <laughs> absolutely. I'm not a massive Amanda Palmer, Palmer fan, um, to be honest, but I, I am definitely a fan of her methods, and and I applaud her for for speaking out and for taking this opportunity to share her story. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, and it's it's an art. I mean. Uh, as she says, you know, it's the art of asking, it's an art in itself and it's also an art to be able to relate to fans in the way that she does. I mean, I follow her on Facebook uh, and she consistently posts interesting stuff on there, which is very, very rare to see somebody do. You know, there's a lot of fluff on Facebook and people posting crap. And so, uh, you know, uh, Matthew, do you think that this is replicable at all? You know, can people learn from this or is it just something for, that you... For some artists, yeah. I mean, I, I think I'm with Jesse, right? I think that methods for... it's you, you, you put the method to the artist. Yeah. There's certain artists who should, you know, who are not that kind of people. There are plenty of artists... A lot of the bands I love, are they're horrible social on social media, right? They're kind of grouchy, nasty people. They're antisocial people, right? They put it into the music. Um, they don't put it into their, their social channels. I think she's she's the kind of artist, her art is her performance, right? That that That's in some ways the bigger piece of her, her, um, her, her, her way of being in the world. And I think... You know, you you got to match the thing with the artist, and we need multiple ways of getting to the to the fan base. I, I'm a fan of a, a, a really old school um, T to C T to fan uh, person, um, Kristen Hirsch, who's had for years. Kristen has had a direct to fan base, and it's a right. small number; it's not massive, but she's been asking and engaging with those guys for more than 20 years now. Um, and I look at that and think about that kind of engagement with your fan base, even though it's a small number. That's created a sustainable thing for her and her her, her world. Other bands aren't great at social media, and, and so really, it's going to be a matter of, you know, finding the right fit and the right strategy for each artist. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, and uh, in, in other news, uh, Peter Bay co-founder Peter Sunda has been released from a Swedish prison uh, after serving a five-month sentence. Uh, uh, there had been an article come, uh, that came out recently around uh, sort of how consumed he was by being in prison and the fact that he felt uh, completely alienated there and everything else. Uh, uh, Sunda had uh, uh, obviously f- uh, one of the co-founders of the Pirate Bay, and so, which is why he ended up uh, in jail. Uh, but he's also the, uh, the founder of uh, uh, Flatter, which was an interesting way to uh, compensate uh, creators, although it hasn't really uh, taken uh, hold uh, outside of uh, Germany, really. It's, it's mostly uh, used in Germany at the moment. Uh, it, I'm just glad that it, it's all sort of been resolved somehow. Uh, and uh, uh, next, uh, uh, Soundhound redesigned their app. So Soundhound has got a completely new look now. I, I checked it out last night and it looks pretty cool. Uh, streamlined, you know, very sort of iOS 8 uh, compliant in terms of design. We've seen a lot of apps that come out uh, uh, like Audio with a redesign that sort of uh, uh, reflects uh, uh, the new uh, the new iOS and the new platforms. Uh, uh, you know, what do you make of Soundhound? That do you use it? I, you know, I guess that they always come as the second fiddle to uh, um, Shazam. Although Shazam has focused a lot on TV, whilst Soundhound is trying to focus on uh, creating similar partnership on the on the radio spectrum. Uh, Jesse, do you think uh, uh, it's you know, from your perspective, do do your friends or yourself use Shazam uh, more than anything? If I'm going to use something, I, I will use Shazam because right. that's what I have on my phone. Um, I've haven't I haven't tried Soundhound. I am actually not terribly aware of of how it compares to Shazam. Is a lot of people are not. Yeah. 
yeah so yeah it's it's a shame i was watching a, an award ceremony the other day and they had shazam tags everywhere and so that's kind of hard to compete with uh, uh, uh for, for your perspective matthew what do you reckon about soundhound and, and their their prospects going forward i mean it's it's a very cool company they got some interesting tech going on they got some cool mm -hmm. data stuff and you know they're trying to open up their apis but still always second best well it's it's a challenging place to be in but i'm not sure uh, you know I, I i actually think we're over over putting a lot of value on this on this particular activity right this right. activity that is that is uh you know people talking about bbc using how many shazam things to decide what goes on the radio seems a bit ridiculous to me i think there's plenty of other signals to look for yeah um is it a feature? Sure. It's an interesting feature that could be in a lot of different things. I know Shazam spent a lot of money over the last couple of years trying to make everyone aware of their TV platform. Yeah. I don't know how successful that's been. I, mean, I think that they've been trying really hard. So um, this is an area that doesn't interest me too much in that sense, that it doesn't seem like it's a major player. I I'm always amazed at how many people that Shazam had, though. They've got a yeah. big number, and they do drive people to download. But um, it doesn't really interest me because it doesn't feel particularly innovative. Yeah. It doesn't feel like it's moving us forward in any place, in any very strong way. I think uh, I'd rather see this as a feature in, in, in all the music services or let people find music. That's great, but I don't know. Yeah, no, absolutely. And uh, and finally, I wanted to talk about this new app uh, called Compose. And I checked it out last night again. Uh, it's a classical music app uh, that's been uh, put forward uh, in a collaboration uh, between Classic uh, FM and uh, uh, Universal through the DECA and Deutsche Grammophone. And uh, uh, essentially, it allows, uh, you know, it's it's a subscription sub, sub, subscription service. Uh, you essentially pay four pounds ninety nine per month, or, uh, or about fifty pounds per year, to access to uh, uh, classical music. Uh, unfortunately, I mean the app looks cool. There's some nice big fonts. I wonder whether it's related to the demographic of the service. Uh, it's it's very readable uh, on on the on the front. Uh, um, it's got some neat features uh, in terms of ideas. For example, the composer section has got a cool selection of composers with their uh, sort of uh, profile picture. Are next to them and you can browse by composers and sort of listen to pieces based on that but the catalog is really restricted because it's only uh, Deutsche Grammophon and Decca recordings uh, and it's not all of them uh, at that it's definitely not all of them because uh, I, I know their catalog is pretty expensive uh, extensive uh, and so I think they're gonna face some challenges at least a launch uh, to convince users that there is value here uh, for example if you if you uh, click on uh, Mendelssohn uh, in the composer category it doesn't actually give you a catalog of his of his material it just gives you the option to play the composer almost like a radio type service if you search uh, for uh, Mendelssohn as well uh, 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 it gives you a list of his works but then you can't choose who's performing them so uh, I'm not sure if there are multiple versions on the app or if there's just one version per work uh, so it's a bit I don't know it seems like a good a, a good idea but the implementation right now just doesn't seem like it's up to scratch to convince anybody to pay uh, uh, Jesse do you think that there is a market for a niche apps I mean I've seen a service for example that was doing dance music streaming it it doesn't seem to have taken off. Uh, in fact, I think it's uh, disappeared off the face of the earth uh, uh, for now. Uh, uh, are we are we over uh, you know genre specific services uh, today? I think there's definitely a market for an app that does classical music well. You know, this is a huge market, and it's as far as I know, not terribly being a part of that market. As far as I know, it's not really being served that well. Yeah. Um, as you say, maybe there are some kinks to work out. It's a much more complex sector of the industry in terms of the way that it's the way that you do have uh, composers and conductors and, you know, loads of different orchestras and all that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, so, you know, it's, it's been an ongoing issue in terms of metadata and what's included and what isn't included in, in the standard players. So if something is going to come along and work to solve those problems, then I think that it has a good chance um, and, and I wish it every success. Yeah, exactly. That's, that's what kind of annoyed me about it is that, you know, the people involved are people that know a lot about classical music and there should have been more functionality there around search and around searching for performers, conductors, composers, uh, uh, specific works uh, in a much more granular sure. fashion, and it's just, maybe they're just doing a, a sort of a lean, um, a lean. Yeah, it seems like types. yeah, yeah, and it seems like more of a lean back experience. I guess it feels like there's a lot of focus on radio, so you can play a selection of classical music, a bit like classic FM, where you don't actually go and choose yourself what you're going to listen to. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't know, uh, Matthew. Uh, what's your take on genre-specific apps? 
I, I like them. I love them. Jesse, I think we, it's a, you know, they reach different audiences, and I think that the, we have tended to focus really very much on an existing audience who is clearly not buying music. Right? Yeah. So, um, you know, if you want to try to reach out to some audiences who have been untapped and unreached, I think an older audience or an audience with money is a good, is a good start, right? Yeah. And so classical tends to be a good demographic for both of those things. Um, you know, I think pop music is a tough space to make a business in. Yeah. Um, it's largely disposable. It changes a lot and it flips around. So, getting into the other genres, getting into uh, you know, getting into to classical, getting into jazz, getting into uh, dance music, um, should have a lot of potential. I just haven't seen anyone spend as much time as maybe they need to. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, like for example, I just had a look on on Spotify. If you if you type uh, Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart, uh, it comes up with a bunch of albums that are sort of Mozart compilations, uh, in a sense, uh, and have uh, uh, various. Oh, don't get me started on on Spotify search. Spotify search is one of the worst <laughs> of all of all the services. Despite how good their services, search is just hugely problematic for Spotify. Yeah. But if I if I so if I search for that, it gives me like a bunch of compilations. Uh, there's no real uh, you know connection to the performer, and I, a lot of the uh, albums that may have been released by famous performers are not included. Whilst if I search for Mozart and Lang Lang, for example, uh, then it brings me to a bunch of uh, different things that include Lang Lang and uh, playing Mozart uh, that weren't included in the original search uh, because of course there would be too many results there so uh, a lot of a lot of stuff to work out when it comes to classical music and also a lot of data that I don't know who owns and uh, you know, I don't know if there's a specialized company that is gathering all the classical. You know, it's music it's, data. it's a shame. I, I I sit on the board for Music Brains, and Music right. Brains has has always had a real challenge of getting this kind of data. And you know, the big companies who own the biggest catalogs, the uh, the Naxos and the Sony's and the Deutsche Grammophons of the world, should be throwing money at in an open source platform like uh, Music Brains. To be honest with you, I I'll pitch them a little bit here to say this is an opportunity to use your fans to use to crowdsource this a little bit to really get behind that. So rather than trying to do it themselves, rather than trying to hold on to that data as, oh, it's got value, we're not going to give this to anybody, they should be giving it away, they should be crowdsourcing it, they should make it an open source platform, and they should really, that would benefit everybody in the space. So, you know, Deutsche Gramophone, open your checkbook and write a check to, to the guys at Music Brands and get them to fix this. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's a good... It's a good challenge uh, to put it to somebody like Spotify as well to try and improve that side of things because then it would drive people to subscribe to that service instead of going to a third-party app uh, yeah. uh, that is, is, is doing the same thing. But I, yeah, the Compose app is cool. I just I think at the moment it doesn't offer much more value than simply listening to Classic FM on the, on the radio, to be honest. Uh, but I, I, I hope that they're going to improve the functionality of it because obviously if sometimes first impressions are all that matters uh, with new adopters and if this starts getting uh, sort of plugged to uh, classic FM listeners and they go and download it and they find that it's not very good that's going to really put a dent into into how they perceive the, the, the space if they haven't tried other apps before so yeah I hope they sort it out before uh, they actually do a major push on it uh, and uh, uh, yeah and uh, finally I wanted to point people out to this other app that I found last night at the music tech meetup uh, let me just find it if I just can uh, which is called Lala it's la hyphen la uh, and it's pretty cool uh, you can essentially tag uh, a little snippet of a video and send it to people uh, sort of linked to the lyrics of the song essentially and, and you can only express yourself through that you can actually add any messaging or anything uh, other than the, the little snippet of music itself so uh, it's different from tune picks in the sense that it's just literally the snippet of the song and nothing else that, that comes out of it uh, so it looks pretty cute and uh, they seem to have uh, been getting a pretty good traction with users uh, with just one one person development uh, uh, shop uh, and so I look forward to seeing uh, uh, your feedback on that uh, uh, too. Uh, anything else, uh, uh, Matthew? Anything from from your end that you want to talk about? Uh, you, we talked about uh, uh, yeah. Soundwave for a sec, and of course, I had those guys uh, on the show twice. Uh, anything else you want to mention? I, I'm playing with uh, Tomahawk this week. Tomahawk nice. has got a new app out, which is which is kind of an open source. It's very geeky. I'm not sure everybody. It's for everybody yet. It's still pretty much, but for anybody who's playing with uh, multiple sources and multiple libraries, it's kind of a nice. I'm nice to see somebody playing in that space. So Absolutely. excited to see how that works out this week. Absolutely, and uh, actually, great catch. I should have mentioned that earlier in the show. Uh, uh, Tomahawk player has launched a new version and uh, uh, it's pretty neat. Uh, if you know, if you were put off by Tomahawk because it, it looked a bit funky or you know you weren't on board with the design or it was confusing before uh, 
now it's really been sorted out it looks much nicer it's much easier to add uh, and connect services and uh, it's on tomahawk-player.org you can go and download that obviously i had sid and uh, and jay on the show a bunch of times so long time listeners of the show will know all about it already and uh, uh, jesse uh, aside from uh, uh, the which platform report anything else you want to mention uh, your end I did just want to go back to Taylor Swift, if I may, yeah, absolutely. because we need to talk about her more clearly. Oh, yeah. um, <laughs> there's a comment that her manager, is it Boketa, Scott Boketa made yeah. uh, in his statement saying, we never wanted to embarrass a super fan. And I just think that that's a, that's a noble thing. You don't want to embarrass a super fan. But super fans, this isn't, this isn't the market for super fans, you know. I mean, his, his argument is saying the friends of the super fan will be taunting them, saying, why did you pay for this album when you can stream it on Spotify? I mean, you know, it's even more free on YouTube or, or yeah. Pirate Bay or somewhere else. I think if he's concerned about embarrassing super fans, then maybe he should be offering some super deals for these super fans, like, like everybody else is, who's actually looking after their super fans yeah. by giving them higher value items, by giving them special and exclusive experiences. And I'm, I'm aware that Taylor Swift has, you know, delved into that world I just think that his argument in this case doesn't really pan out, and, and it's been burning a hole in my pocket this whole show, which is why I had to use. This <laughs> no, no, it makes it makes a lot of sense. I, 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 I'm, I, I'm, I'm with you there. Like, I don't, I don't understand how, uh, you know, the fact that they have that they are streaming the album for free is, you know, the people that bought it, they can carry it around with them. They can have it on their players. They can do whatever they want with them with with the album. I mean, if 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 anything. You know, they could be taunted by somebody that has a premium subscription and says, I can cash it on my phone. But at the same time, you know, they are paying $10, well, $10 a month. Well, they're not for very nice friend. That was yeah, exactly. Going on. <laughs> I just don't think that that... No, it doesn't make any sense. There's not... I don't think there's that many points of discussion with between friends as to how you get hold no, of the music no. okay. once exactly. you have it. But I think that it does raise a point that, you know, Spotify as a service does cap its profits at, at 120 x max per user whether that's pounds or dollars you know that's that's another that's another beef um but i think this could be more if they were to i mean i wonder whether they're experimenting looking into a different range of um of, of subscription options and this is right. something that's been discussed elsewhere but you know there's there's potentially ways of having a, a varied product mix which might include exclusives or bonus content or extra extra interviews that kind of thing which could actually look to increase the value of the people who are willing to pay more which i think there is a market for. Yeah, yeah, and I mean, I, we've seen, for example, the deal with a, a band page. They are not taking a cut or anything. So uh, I think that they're, they're trying to remain on the outside of the space at the moment. I don't know if there's anything being worked on internally, but they are seeing themselves as a pure music service. And so mm. I, I, I guess they're trying to look at anything else that happens around the music as ancillary and not directly related to Spotify, at least not yet, uh, unless they see that it can actually generate some sig significant uh, significant revenues. Uh, uh, Matthew, do you, do you think it makes sense for them to keep it that way and, and not try and get uh, involved into the complex uh, uh, D2C space directly? Look, I, I ran one of those services for a couple of years. I know how complicated it is, and, 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 and Jesse knows as well, too. You know, the, running a, a services for fulfillment and all the things you need to do when you do direct to fan stuff is really hard. Customer service is deep on that. I, and if it, if it were me, I wouldn't, as an artist manager, I wouldn't want to give Spotify a cut of that. I'd, I'd be looking yeah. to build out my own platforms, right? That's, you know, you, what you're using for any of these services that create great reach and great awareness of your music, you want to drive them back to your own platforms. I say this about Spotify and Facebook and, and YouTube, right? I mean, unless you're using it to pull those audiences into your own world where you control and you have direct access to them, you're basically just adding another middleman and sharing more of the pie with them. So yeah. whenever you can, you want to be sending those super fans to your own platform. I, I tell, used to tell people at Facebook, don't throw a party at Mark Zuckerberg's house, right? It's just, <laughs> just if you're just creating more fans for him. Throw it at your own, put them, send them to your own sources, send them to your own yeah. website, send them to your own places where you're, where you're, where you're actually benefiting from that relationship yeah. um, rather than filtering it through more and more people. Yeah. And um, Matthew, sorry, last thing, uh, about what Jesse mentioned that triggered something else that I was uh, thinking about earlier was, uh, you know, in your experience, you worked at Last FM, you know, in your experience, how difficult is it for a service like Spotify to keep track of what's 
uh, you know, on live and what's not live on the platform in terms of <laughs> in terms of recommendations. Yeah. So the recommendation side is what really puzzles me because obviously yeah. they're, they're creating a lot of playlists. Uh, a lot of what's happening on Spotify is still relatively automated. So through the Econest acquisition and, and other sort of automated methods of creating uh, radios and playlists. Uh, do you think that puts a bit of a spanner in the works when a release is, uh, is pulled and they have to sort of reshuffle everything around to uh, make sure the playlist still flows or still works? Yeah, I mean, I think... I it, it certainly sucks to have all that stuff flying in and out of your catalog all the time. We definitely have those problems. Um, for the most part, though, I don't think fans notice. I mean, to be honest with you, unless you're running a Taylor Swift pla you know, a playlist, um, yeah. you know, yes, you'll miss it, but you'll, chances are very good. And, and I have a lot of faith in the Equinox guys. They are the best in the business right now of yeah. recommendations as Last FM has really stopped investing in that space. Um, you've also got people like Grace Note trying to do algorithmic playlist generation, and, and they're also very good, but they're still behind Echo Nest on this. Yeah. So Spotify's got the best in the business at this. I just think it's always going to be a combination of human and machine and algorithmic generated creation. It's not robots versus humans at all, the yeah. way that uh, Beats versus Spotify is lining up. It's it's we need to continue to make discovery an important part of it, but most people don't care. They're that they're happy with the services they have. I don't think it's a major selling point for any of the services. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And uh, it might actually be more of a headache for Deezer because they have a, yeah. a bigger editorial team and they do a lot of playlists uh, curated. Uh, they're curated manually, and so if, if tracks are removed uh, and there's a specific flow that the editor wanted to give to a playlist, yeah. then it makes it, it makes it harder to go back and edit it. Uh, whilst perhaps the algorithm can adapt uh, automatically to what's going on. Well, th this is also why I don't think that any one service is never going to be able to solve the playlisting thing, right? Yeah. I mean, we, we get our, I don't know about you, but I get sources from, my music sources are from everywhere, right? I get YouTube sometimes, sometimes a SoundCloud link. I get it wherever I need to, but I hunt for that stuff because I take the time. Yeah. Most fans don't care. Most fans aren't spending that much time on this stuff. Most people want a lean back experience. Mark Mulligan is very clear. This is the, the, the kind of lean back lazy folks are, are much about pressing a button and playing and hearing what they hear. And if they don't hear yeah. one artist track, they move on to the next one pretty quickly. Absolutely. Well, it was a, such a pleasure having you on. I, I had a, a really, really fun today, and it was a pretty fluid show as well. Uh, moving from one thing to up to the other, uh, I hope you enjoyed it as well. And uh, uh, thanks so much for joining me today. Uh, once again, uh, um, uh, Matthew Hone, uh, you can find him on at Jukevox on Twitter if you are uh, listening to the show rather than watching it. Uh, of course, if you're watching it, the handle is right there. And for uh, Jesse, you can find her on at Wixsteedworks or on Wixsteedworks.com. Com. Thanks so much for joining me today. Thank you. Thanks. And thanks for listening to DMT. You can find it on digitalmusictrends.com and uh, listen uh, on pretty much any uh, audio streaming service, including TuneIn, Stitcher, Audio Boost, Spreaker, uh, SoundCloud, uh, uh, iTunes, everywhere that hosts uh, an audio stream, and of course YouTube uh, and uh, podcatchers for the video uh, version of the show. Thanks so much for listening. Have a fantastic week, and until uh, next time. <laughs> <laughs>